الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إكرارا به وتوحيدا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما مزيدا أما بعد فحياكم الله إخوان في الله وأخوات في الله It gives me alhamdulillah honor and joy to come and visit my brothers and our sisters that have gathered to remind one another regarding this beautiful religion that we have been blessed with this deen of Islam and then from that Alhamdulillah, the sunnah of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us in Jannah as he has united us here today. Ameen. Alhamdulillah, regarding tonight's subject matter. Subject matter that is often spoke about and things that we have heard plentiful. But it is also a deep, deep topic and not easy to talk about. Especially when our Lord Allah Azza wa Jal has informed us regarding the reality of this world, the place that we live in. And it's a reminder that we never get tired of. Because we are living, we are living through it. And we're all facing the battles of living in this place that Allah Azza wa Jal has created as a test for us. Now, every lesson that we do or every reminder that we do, La shak wa la raib, fa in al astak al kalam kalam Allah, wa al khair al hadi hadi Muhammadin sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The best speech is the speech of Allah, and the best guidance is the guidance of our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So whenever we talk about a subject matter. Regardless of what it is, this is what we have to start off with. We start off with the best speech. Any mawdu that we wish to discuss, any subject matter, then let us utilize the best speech. And that is the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. And there on after, which is wahi and also a revelation, is the sunnah of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what our ulama have taught us. That when you talk about a matter, then let the matter be spoke about regarding the best speech and the best guidance. Then after that, we utilize the aqwal of the salaf, the statements of the salaf. For verily, kalamahum anfa' min kalamina. Their speech is more beneficial than our speech. So this is the, inshallah, tariqa wal khutawat that we will use. We're talking about the dunya, the reality of this world. And who is better to tell us about the reality of this world than the one that created it? If we really want to know the ins and outs about this dunya, then let's take time to look at what the one that created Azzawajal has said regarding this dunya. Number one, because he is most knowledgeable regarding it. And Allah Azzawajal is the most truthful in speech. So if there is ever any doubt in anything else, then there is no doubt in what our Lord tells us. So this is what I want to start off with first. That before we start, and obviously we're going to start off with the words of the Creator. He created this dunya that we are living in. So let's see what Allah Azawajal says about the dunya. And focus in the short period that we will be here. As if for those Allah Azawajal is addre addressing you directly. As if for those the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is addressing us directly. And it is. It is directly. Why? Because it is the kalam of Allah. 
and it is the sunnah of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the guidance that we have to live by and die by. So I'll start off on that note, focus. Remember who is the one that is telling you this. And this principle, I'm not going to attribute it to myself. Because from the zakat al-ilm and the amanat al-ilm, is that you attribute that knowledge back to his sahib, back to the one that originated it. And that is here, is Hassan al-Basri. This muqaddimah what I've just told you, and imagine who is telling you, this is how the Salaf were when they would come across these verses. وَعَنِ الْمُبَارَكِ ابْنِ فَضَالَةِ قَالْ كَانَ الْحَسَنَ الْبَصْرِ رَحِمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِذَا تَلَى هَذِي الْعَيَى فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغُرُورِ Ibn Mubarak ibn Fadala, he said that when Hassan al-Basri would recite the following verse, and that verse is, do not let the life of this world deceive you. And do not let the chief deceiver, meaning the shaitan, deceive you regarding your Lord. After reciting this, he would say, Man qala that? Who is saying this? So he would recite the verse. Then he would address the people around him and say, Who is saying this? Then he would say, Qalahu man khalaqaha wa huwa a'lama biha. The one that is saying it, is the one that created it, the dunya. And he is most knowledgeable regarding the dunya. I thought that is an appropriate athar to start off with. To get in that mindset. That what we are about to hear, who is the one that is telling us these verses? Indeed, it is the one that he has created, the one that created it. And he is most knowledgeable regarding it. And what does he say? Lend me your ears. قال الله عز وجل اعلموا أن الحياة الدنيا لعبا ولحوا وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد الله عز وجل he says no addressing us no that the life of this world is nothing but play and amusement Allah is telling us this Nothing but play and amusement and mutual boasting amongst you. That's what it is. We like to boast with what we possess. What Allah, Allah has given us, the nature of man is he likes to show what he has. His wealth. So this is what Allah says. It is only mutual boasting amongst yourselves. And then he said, and rivalry in respect of your wealth and your children. This is the nature of this dunya. And we fall into it without even real, realizing. Rivalry. It's plain amusement. This is how Allah has described it. Allah describes it that way. وَقَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَفَرِحُوا بِالْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا مَتَاعٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, and I'll give you also the references as well. Surah al Ra'ad, verse 26. And they are pleased with the life of this world. And what is the life of this world in respect to the hereafter except for a passing amusement? Verses that you and me have heard. But the mushkila is is it affecting our hearts? Is it making us reflect? We have to pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that it does touch our hearts. One of the ways is that know that the Creator is telling you this. It's nothing but plain amusement. Nothing. And it is nothing in comparison to the hereafter. No comparison. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again says, And what is the life of this world? except for a deceiving enjoyment. It is deceiving. How does it deceive the Mufassirun say that you allow what is in this dunya to be neglectful regarding your duty towards Allah, your duty towards 
your Lord and the wajibat. And even far worse, falling into haram due to you wanting to have ease and bliss in this life. Compromising your religion. And at that time when you were indulging in it, you are blinded. And that enjoyment is not making you realize. And this is why Allah refers it to as deceiving. It deceives you. These are all things which Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us, my brothers and my sisters. If my speech or any other human being's speech is causing you to doubt, then don't doubt the speech of your Lord. Allah is telling us regarding where we are living in, the reality of it. وَقَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا اللَّعِبًا وَاللَّحْوًا وَلَا الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَتَّقُونَ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ These verses in itself, wallahi, should be sufficient for us as a reminder. Even if we don't take anything else. The mere fact that our Lord, my Lord, your Lord is telling us these words. And what is the life of this world except for play and amusement? And the hereafter is better. Better for those who fear him. Better for those who walk the path, the straight path. And you notice Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, it is better for them. Those who yattaqoon. Those who don't transgress. Because it's not better for the ones that transgress. It's not better for the ones that are blind in this life. It's not better for the one that choose the enjoyment that is very, very short. It's not better for them because they will meet Allah Azza wa Jal. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala and when he was questioned regarding this dunya, sif al dunya, explain to us regarding the dunya. He said, do you want the long version or you want the short version? Aqsaruha. They said the short version. He said regarding the halal and what you carry out by way of halal, then you will be rewarded with that. Amma haramuha fannar. As for the haram and the haram that you do, then there is nar. Simple as that. Short and simple. You utilize the khair and you carry out that which is lawful, then your Lord will reward you. You oppose that, then you don't repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. The only thing that waits us is nar. And we seek refuge in Allah from that. Al Hafid bin Kathir, Rahimullah, regarding these verses, and especially the last verse, he says, That what Allah has referred to the dunya, then the majority of it is this. The majority of it is this. And this is why the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned that his dunya is mal'una. Mal'un ma fiha, that this world is cursed. And all that which is in it, it is cursed. And then Allah, then the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just gave you a few exceptions. That which is the remembrance of Allah, why we are here. The remembrance of Allah and that which comes with the ibadah and the remembrance of Allah azza wa jal. And then the alim and the muta'allim. Then the scholar and then the student of knowledge. Because they learn about that one thing that is not cursed. And that is the remembrance of Allah. The ibadah of Allah Azza wa Jal. They are most knowledgeable regarding that. So this is what Hafi bin Kathir, he said that the majority of our dunya, and you look, how many Muslims do we have on the earth? And from amongst the Muslims, they are the minority in comparison to the disbelievers. And then from the Muslims, how many amongst the Muslims are really upon deen and practicing? So they're the minority. So the majority is how Allah Azza wa Jal has explained. قال الله عز وجل ذلك ذلك متاع الحياة الدنيا والله عنده الحسن المعاب. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala addressing his slaves with kalam which is belief, addressing his slaves and letting them know that the life of this world. It is only an enjoyment that is brief. Wallahu indul husnul ma'ab. But what is with Allah is a most excellent return. Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us 
Who's that? <laughs> now we can't have that and then they tell him to shut up. How, how is that outside? I will speak outside. How do you show Shalaya? That's a mushkila. That's going to be a bit of a problem. <laughs> okay. They have to sink it. <laughs> oh. However, let's continue, my brothers and my sisters. Well, I, I cannot emphasize enough that Alhamdulillah, you've heard these verses before. I'm sure that you have heard these verses before. I'm sure that Alhamdulillah, many lectures, you have come across these verses as well. But we have to now adopt a different mindset. We have to have that mindset of the Salaf. The Salaf were better than us. But yet look how they reacted towards these verses. Look how their mindset was. And the reason I'm saying that is, we can't be brothers and we can't be sisters and we can't be Muslims that have been on the deen for 10 years, 15 years, and we say, oh yeah, I know that verse. Yes, I've heard that before. Yes, we are aware of that. But it's not having no impact on us. The Sahaba would hear one verse, one verse. When Umar ibn Khattab heard that verse, that everyone will cross the hellfire. Everyone has to cross it. He became ill for days. And yet we know that he was promised Jannah. So no one is above these verses. No one is above. We should never think that we are better than our brother. The one that sits here in front of you is no better than you. As Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, when he became Khalifa, he said the same words and we follow that sunnah. We are not better than you. Anything that we try to do of khair and it's sawab, it's from Allah Azza wa Jal. So aid us with that. Anything that we fall short in, then aid us to return back to the truth as well. This is the mindset that we have. Too many of us have that kind of attitude that, yeah, I've heard that before. I need something else. This is the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. And if we've heard it before, then why is it having an impact? And I'm not addressing my brother. I address myself first. Why is it? That Allah, our Lord, is telling us regarding the reality of this world. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's not having an impact on us, our families, and our children. Why? Why is it not affecting us? Why is it not saving us from the sins that we are falling in? You have to ask yourself this question. Now, we'll move on to some of the ahadith. Regarding this dunya. Because that is revelation as well. Our manhaj is we utilize the best speech and the best guidance. وعن سعيد الخضر رضي الله تعالى عن عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن الدنيا حلوة خضرة وإن الله مستخلفكم فيها فينظر كيف تعملون. The Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم one of my favorite hadith never get tired with narrating it. Because of the heaviness of its meaning. And because of the guidance that he gives for us, how we should be. Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, talking about this dunya. And our lecture here is about this dunya. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was sent as a mercy to mankind, he said that this dunya, this world that we live in, the nature of it, it is sweet and green. So it's tempting. Sweet and green. And Allah Azza wa Jal will establish you upon this earth. Generations after generations. And Allah will give you what you need. So Allah Azza wa Jal then sees what you do. What you do. Obviously Allah is all aware of what you do. But it will be a hujjah for us or against us. Then after the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam describing. Look at the nasiha of the messenger. Look how he was a mercy to mankind. He tells us regarding the reality of where we are. Sweet and green. Sweet and green meaning that it's going to be tempting. And it's going to be tempting to the degree where we fall short. And then the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us that Allah is watching you. To see what you do. And then sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave that nasiyah. 
فَتَّقُوا الدُّنْيَا So be aware of the dunya. Be aware. Fear the dunya. Do not fall. بِالْمَعْنَى Don't fall into the deceiving elements of it. It may be bliss and it may seem sweet, but in reality it is evil. It's not there for you. It's not there for us. For our maslaha. The only maslaha that we have in the dunya is living the way that Allah is pleased and has ordained for us to worship Him. This is what we have to utilize. All of the other stuff, la fa'ida. And then, فَتَّقُوا النِّسَاءَ فَإِنَّ الْأَوَّلَ الْفِتْنَةِ بَنِي إِسْرَائِلِ كَانَتْ فِي النِّسَاءَ And fear the fitna of the woman. For verily, the first fitna that came to Bani Israel was their women. Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rawahu muslim. The messenger has told us that in itself, alhamdulillah, is sufficient for the people of understanding. Also, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us now, regarding the one that created this dunya, how he sees this dunya. He's created it as a test. But what value does this dunya have to Allah? The creator of this huge universe that we live in. And this dunya that we live in. Qala Nabiyyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Law kanati dunya ta'dilu inda Allah azza wa jal, janaha ba'udah, ma saka kafiran minhuma sharbatan ma, aw minha sharbatan ma, rawahu tirmidhiyu, wa sahahu shakalbani rahimullahu ta'ala. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, that if this dunya, had any worth with Allah, any qima with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have to understand, the one that created it, he is now saying regarding what worth it has. If it had any worth to Allah, to the equivalent of a wing of a mosquito, look at the similitude that Allah is saying. That the Messenger sallallahu is saying regarding Allah, a wing of a mosquito, how big is that of a creation? Tiny. If it was even the worth of a wing of a mosquito, then Allah Azza wa Jal would not even give them a drink of water to the disbeliever. Now, if that is what it is with Allah, then why are me and you falling so short? Everyone has his story. I'm saying me and you because I fall short. And may Allah forgive me of my shortcomings. May Allah forgive me, my brothers and my sisters, of our shortcomings. We don't know how long we have left. How is it that we are given importance? We may not speak to our brother or our sister because something related to the dunya. We may not speak to our blood brother because some affair of the dunya. And bal, even as far as parents, children, forsaking their father and mother, the mother that gave the child birth, suckled them when, she, when they were young, went through all that hardship, and yet they don't even speak, because something related to the dunya that Allah Azza wa Jalla said is insignificant. What are we doing, my brothers and my sisters? We, as the people of the Sunnah, should be more understanding to this point. Also, another hadith which shows you how insignificant this dunya is, is the statement of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ الْمَوْضِعْ صَوْتٍ فِي الْجَنَّةِ خَيْرٌ مِّنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا فِيهَا The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, and this is also in Bukhari, we don't doubt, that the area which is similar to the size of a whip, you know a whip, that area in Jannah, which is tiny in comparison to what we have here. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that area which is the size of a whip, if you was to roll that up, it's something like this, tiny. Only that piece of Jannah is better than the whole of this dunya and what is ever in this dunya. So let that be something that we can reflect upon. Because the majority of the sins that we are falling into is something which is related to the dunya. 
and especially in the realms of wealth, how we compromise. That small part in Jannah is better than anything in the dunya. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, al fajr. The two rakat of fajr. And this is referred to the sunnah prayers. The nawafil, two rakat, is better than the whole of the dunya and what is in the dunya. So don't ever think that you're poor. You may be poor with the wealth that you don't have in your hands. You may not be able to buy the most expensive cars. We may not be able to own the most greatest of homes. And we may not have the best garments, we may struggle. Well, like in Allahu Akbar, we have kitab and we have sunnah. And if you have that, and you're acting upon that, even if you are the poorest in the eyesight of the people, you're rich. Because you have the promise of Allah. Because if you live by that way, and you die that way, then wallahi, wallahi, thumma tallahi, you have a vast fortune waiting for you in Jannah. With Allah's mercy. May Allah make us from them. Ameen. Also, another hadith, Alhamdulillah, that we selected for tonight's lecture is that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once again, Wallahi, we have to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and send salutations upon the one who came as a mercy. Look at, at the clarification that he gave this Ummah. Look what he left us with. Look how much zeal and effort that he gave to clarify every last thing in every department to save us from fitna. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَمَنْ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا كَمَا يَجْعَلُ أَحَدَكُمْ إِسْبَعُ هَذِي فِي الْيَمْ فَلْيَنْذُرْ بِمَا يَرْجَعُ رواه مسلم The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam given us kalam that even the child can understand. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what is the similitude of the life that we have here, the time that we have here, in comparison to the hereafter. Except that it's like if somebody was to dip his finger into the ocean and then remove his finger and whatever is left that drop on his finger, that is what the reality of this world is in comparison to the hereafter. Now look at the size of an ocean. The ocean is so vast that our eyes cannot even see the end of it. How many drops would you need to make an ocean? One drop, the messenger, what an example that he gave. That's why he had kalam, which is jami' al-kalim. Short speech, vast in meaning. What an example that he gave. One drop of the ocean is like the life that we have here in comparison to the hereafter. O oh, people of understanding, O oh, Allah, make us understand so we're not blinded from the place that we live in. What is that one drop? And not only that, we may be understanding, but we should also make dua that Allah gives us that ilm al yaqeen, that Allah gives us that knowledge of certainty, because we may know and we may believe, just like the Yahud, they know regarding the truth, but they cannot bring themselves to act upon it. So even that element of having that yaqeen and acting upon having that certainty is a mercy from Allah. And this is why we should always constantly, whatever level we reach of ilm, whatever level we reach of what we have achieved in the dunya, never forget that the tawfiq that you have is all from Allah. And constantly bring that tawfiq back to Allah. My brother, my sister, if there's any nasir that I could give myself and you, never ever become amazed with what you have. Anything you have is from the mercy of Allah. Everything. So constantly be thankful for that. And Allah Azza wa Jal will increase it. Ad-dunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the life of this world, it is like a prison for the believers. And it is a paradise for the disbeliever. Ahl al-ilm, they have said, because of the restrictions that we have, we don't just follow our desires and do whatever we want. But rather, the one that is muttaqi, the 
The one that fears Allah doesn't transgress. So his life is in order. He wakes in the morning with the remembrance of Allah. He has his duty to pray and worship Allah. To humble himself and put his, dead, his head down in prostration in front of his Lord. There's a way he dresses. There's a way he speaks. So because of all of these restrictions, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described this world as a prison. But these mizan and these tables were turned in the hereafter. So that was an introduction of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this dunya and what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said. So now we move on to how did the Salaf they understand this. How did the Salaf understand these words? You ready? Can I have a swig of this? Bismillah. Who is the one that when he would recite the verse, do not let the life of this world deceive you and do not let the chief deceiver deceive you regarding your Lord. Man kala that he used to say, who was the one that said that? Huh? Hassan al-Basri, Hassan al Okay. <clears throat> now we'll inshallah take the akwal of the salaf. And this is one of my favorite parts as well. Not that it will be anfa' min kalamillah wa sunnati nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but to show you their dikka understanding, their understanding of the nusus and the textual evidences which caused them to say what they said and live the way which they lived, the effect that he has had on them. And they're better than us. Remember, they're better than us. But look at the same verses and the textual evidences which we have mentioned, how it would affect them. And how it would cause them to live. Ibn Mubarak, rahimullah, he said, حب الدنيا هو الذي عمر النار بأهلها. Ibn Mubarak, he would say, that yearning and having love for this life, that is what will cause the nar to be plentiful. Meaning of its inhabitants. وَالزُّحُدْ فِي الدُّنْيَا and to abstain from the dunya. And the ones that do not give that importance to the dunya and have that mentality, it is that that will fill paradise. I'm going to listen to what he went on to say. He said that the intoxication that is caused by having love of this dunya is far greater than being intoxicated with alcohol. Let me repeat that again. Are you, are you following me? The in, when you get intoxicated, intoxicating is when you lose your akal. You no longer know your bearings, what you're saying, what is right. So Ibn Mubarak is saying that to be intoxicated due to your love of the dunya. If you let this dunya take you away to the degree where your akal is no longer functioning correctly, that intoxication is far greater and dangerous than the intoxication of alcohol. You follow? Then he's going to explain why. Why? فَسَكْرُ بِالْخَمَرِ يَسْتَفِيقْ صَاحِبُهُ خَالِبًا When you get drunk, and intoxicated from alcohol, there is a possibility that you will become sober again. Do you remain drunk all the time when you have alcohol? There is, comes a time when you become sober. غالباً. So you may become sober at some point. However, he said, As-sakru bihubbu dunya فَلَا يَسْتَفِيقُ صَاحِبُهُ إِلَّا فِي ظَلَمَةِ اللَّحَدِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ The one that gets intoxicated due to this dunya, that this dunya blinds him to the degree that he is intoxicated. And what is meant that he is intoxicated, not that he is actually intoxicated like he is drunk, but the similitude is 
that his mind is not functioning correctly. His mind is forgetting the akhirah. His mind is only focusing on the affairs of the dunya and it's blinding him as if although he's intoxicated. And when you're in that state, Ibn Mubarak, he said that you will not become sober, meaning you won't wake from that and come to reality up until you are in the darkness of your grave. That's when you will wake up. So, being intoxicated of the dunya, la ilaha illallah, the Salaf realized how dangerous it was. And this is why Yahya ibn Mu'adh, he would say something which is similar. He would say, ad dunya khamaru shaitan. He said, this dunya, meaning the fitna of it. And what we mean by the dunya, it doesn't mean that we can't live and we can't be happy and we can't laugh. But the murad is here is that that becomes akbar alham. That is the most important thing. And to get whatever the dunya offers, you will neglect Allah. You will neglect your rights of your Lord. You will neglect yourself. You will fall into haram. This is the intent. But generally, we have to live in this dunya. And we have to earn. And alhamdulillah, we have to, alhamdulillah, doesn't mean that we can't smile. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would laugh with his companions. That's not the understanding. The understanding is that it's everything for you. That's your goal. You wake up in the morning, it's only dunya, dunya, dunya. You even fall and compromise your religion because of the dunya, what it offers. So that's the intent. So, Yahya ibn Mu'adh, he said that this dunya, the fitna of it, that is the intoxication of the shaitan. Man sakhara minha, fala yufiq illa fi askar al mawta nadiman min al khasirin. He said, that this dunya is the intoxication of the shaitan. Whomsoever is intoxicated by it, then he will not become sober and will not wake from it, except that he will be amongst the ranks of the dead. And he will be amongst those who are regretful and amongst the losers. And we seek refuge in Allah from that. So look at the words of what the Salaf gave. Look how they... Look at the words that they derived from this. Look how they understood. And how much hazard they have. And how they were very cautious. Sufyan, Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimullah, would often quote and say, Inna dunya bahrun amik. Wallah, this should be written in gold. Wallah, jameel jiddan. He said, verily, this dunya is a deep ocean it is a deep ocean many have drowned in it this world deep ocean and many have drowned in it therefore he said therefore you because it's referred to as an ocean he said so you have the ship. So you be the ship that sails through this dunya. That ship that you will be and you will have that sails through this dunya. Let it be the taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal. So the, you be the ship that sails through it. And let your ship be the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he said, وَحَشْوُهَا imanun billahi Azza wa Jal. And the load that this ship stakes, the cargo that it will load, the ship, let it be the iman of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَشَرَاعُهَا أَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ And let the sail of this ship be, the sails of this ship be, the tawakkal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, jameel jiddan. So this ocean is deep. This dunya is a deep ocean. Many are drowning in it. And we see this today. Us, and we would like to think that we are the people of the Sunnah. We are the ones most knowledgeable about Allah and the Messenger. Most knowledgeable about the Sunnah. This is this title that we attribute ourselves to. Alayhi Salafiya. Salafiyyah. Salafiyyah is the most finest interpretation of the deen, of the way of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Meaning that is the only way. So we like to attribute ourselves to that which is the correct way. And that correct way is telling us this. 
So we should be the one that are most cautious regarding what we are hearing today. Because we're attributing ourselves to Salafiyah. We're the ones that are supposed to be most knowledgeable about this. So if we're the most knowledgeable about this, what are we doing about it? Why is it that me and you are falling so short? Why is it that our children are falling so short? Why? Why are we drowning in this world? Why are we compromising ourselves to that degree? And yet, we have all of this ilm bayna yadayna or bayna aydina between our hands and what we have. We have this knowledge that has reached us. But still, it doesn't seem to be something that we are reflecting and helping us. Allahu musta'an. And then, from amongst those who advise us, then because of our nature and what we're going through, we don't want to take the nasiyah. We're falling short. And when someone better than us comes along to advise us, or he may not even be better, but he generally may have love for you and he advises us, then we don't even want to take the nasiha. Then we look in a wrong eye towards him. Well, what is happening to us, brothers and sisters? What is going wrong with us? Yet Allah, from his favors, has given us so much. Now I move on to a beautiful statement which is mentioned by Ibn al-Qayyim in his book, Fawaid. What's this? Oh, we need to make an announcement to move a car. They will do it from another mic. Okay, tafadalu. Car park announcement. Two vehicles to move immediately. MA17LHZ. MA17LHZ. Also, WJ58HNW. WJ58HNW. Silver Honda. Please return to your car immediately. <clears throat> Very nice tea, Alhamdulillah. Babe, whose statement are we going to take now? Ibn al Qayyim. In which book? Al-Fawaid, MashaAllah, Hafad. Ibn Al-Qayyim, you know, SubhanAllah, in his understanding was very deep. Was very deep. And would look at the dunya, and then he would be able to bring Fawaid, which was like, La ilaha illallah, verily this man was blessed. How could he even utilize or even come to that? But listen to what he says here. Now, he's going to mention certain things that are fitna and trials for the majority of the people. And then look what he said. So he said regarding this dunya, he said, كَيْفَ يَسْلَمُ مَنْ لَهُ زَوْجَةٌ And I'm going to say before I translate it, sisters, it's not directly directed to you. It's just the wording. Tamam? Because I don't want to say, well, what about the husbands? This is what Ibn al-Qaim is mentioned, and I'm just translating but Alhamdulillah, remember, it's also applicable to the husband as well. This is what we do. Whenever nusus or things like this come along, it goes both ways. However, كَيْفَ يَسْلَمُ مَنْ لَهُ زَوْجَةٌ لَا تَرْحَمُهُ I can see all the brothers smiling. طيب, how can he be safe? The one that has a wife that shows him no mercy. But we can also translate that. That how can the one be safe that has a partner that shows no mercy? That's even better. Taib. So, so are you following? So Ibn al kaymi starts off by saying, how can the one be safe that has a partner, a zawja, that shows him no mercy? Or that he has a child. That does not make any excuse for the parent. Taib does not excuse him. Or the one that has a neighbor that he does not feel safe with. Or the one that has a companion that does not advise him. Or he has a partner 
when it comes to trade and business who does not deal with him fairly wa'adun la yanamu an ma'adatihi or the one that has an enemy and his enemy does not sleep except that he has it is harb- harboring enmity towards him wa nafsun amaratun bisu and then the one that has a soul that commands him to evil wa dunya mutazayyinatun and a world and a dunya which is beautified are you following the the fitan of the dunya what he's all mentioning they so he's saying how can then one how will one be when he has to face all of this wa hawa murdin a desire that he has that it destroys a desire that destroys wa shahwatun ghalibatun la and he has a lust or a desire that overtakes him wa ghadabun qahirun and he has an anger that subdues him controls him wa shaytanun muzayyinun and he has that devil that beautifies things for him wa dha'fun mustawallin alay and he has that weakness is that weakness that dominates him Allah should be written in gold then ibn al qayyim he says fa inta wallahu allah azza wa jal wa jadhabahu ilay but if allah azza wa jal turns him away from this and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to draw him to him in qaharat lahu hadhi qullaha all of these trials all of these things all these affairs will become subdued for him diminished if he returns to allah and you with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then listen to ibn al qayyim he mentions wa in takhalla anhu wa wakkalahu ila nafsihi ijtama'at alayhi fa kanat al halaqa la ilaha illallah and if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves him alone and if allah azza wa jal was to leave him and entrust him to himself meaning to deal with these things himself then indeed all of these affairs were combined against him and will cause destruction for him my brothers and my sisters we have no solution except that we turn back to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all of what we are facing if we do not tackle what we are facing with the aid of allah with the guidance of allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam by allah we will not survive we will not survive if this is left to our own devices the fitna that we are facing today is very dark and evil and it will only get worse and if we don't start to wake up to that reality and cling and learn and cling to everything which allah has given us by way of protection and by the way of the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is as ibn al qayyim has mentioned look at the things that ibn al qayyim mentioned that day to day a person faces whether it's his neighbor whether it's his own nafs whether it's anger all of these obstacles what we all mentioned but if you turn to allah and allah takes you away from that then all of this will go but if we're left to deal with it ourselves then it is only destruction also now we move on to the statement of ibn mas'ud ibn mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala he said man arad al akhirah adara bid dunya this is the reality ibn mas'ud he said that whomsoever intends the hereafter if you want the akhirah that is what you want then no this dunya will harm you has to be this dunya will harm you it ain't going to be easy you're going to be tested if you want the akhirah wa man arad ad dunya adara bil akhirah and whoever chooses this life and you want this life then no that the akhirah will harm you there is harm for you in the akhirah and it's as simple as that we have to make that choice 
And we have to explain that choice to our families. It's either this life or the akhirah. If you want this life and you want to compromise your deen, and you want to anger Allah Azza wa Jal, your Lord, the one that has told us about this dunya, then no, khalas. A brief enjoyment. It will occur. But there's a heavy, heavy day that's going to await us. So we seek refuge in Allah from that. So, Afwan, the end of that part, he mentions, Ya qawm, fa'adarru bilfani lil baqi. So then he said, Ya qawm, O oh people, if you have to be harmed and face trials and difficulties, then do it in, with that which is going to perish. For that which is everlasting. Akhirah is everlasting. Imma nar or imma jannah. So if you have to have trials and difficulties, do it for something which is not going to be everlasting. It's going to perish. For the bigger picture of the Akhirah, which never comes to an end. Listen to this beautiful statement. Qala ibn Sammaq, rahimullah ta'ala, ad-dunya kullaha qalilun. Follow this with me. If you can write this down, write it down. No, the life of this world is short in itself. The lifespan that we have in this dunya, it is short in comparison to the hereafter. So that's the first part. The life of this world is short. <laughs> so this life is short. What Allah has given the lifespan of this dunya, it's short. And what that lifespan that we've been given, that time in this dunya, what we have been given, from that, what remains is short. So what we have been given of the dunya is short anyway. And then what remains for what we was given is short. Are you following? Taib? وَالَّذِي لَكَ مِنَ الْبَاقِ قَلِيلٌ so that which remains from the short period, what you have been given, your time here, your lifespan, that is even shorter. So what you have been given is even shorter. And that shortness period that you've been given, what remains of that is very short. So how long have we got left now? Allah knows best. Ilm in Allah Azza wa Jal. But generally, in comparison to the lifespans that the human being has, how long have we got left? Wallah, deep words. This should make us reflect. If only Allah Azza wa Jal gave us that ilm, and may Allah put that in our hearts, that ilm al yaqeen. You know when that yaqeen hits, where we don't have no doubt and we live for that? We live for the Akhirah. As some of the Salaf they used to say, when things become difficult for them, then they will travel to the Akhirah. They will travel to the Akhirah. Meaning that their mindset will travel to the Akhirah. How will it be on that great standing? How will it be with Allah? How will it be that day? The difficulties of it. If we're in Jannah, what Allah Azza wa Jalla has promised us. So they will travel there. And because they would constantly do this traveling to the Akhirah in their minds, in their mindset, it's, it's as if for those they became ahlaha. They became the people of that. So this is the mindset that we have to have. Our minds have to be connected with the Akhirah. Whenever th things get difficult, think of the Akhirah. Think of the promise of Allah. Think of the punishment of Allah. Next one now, Sufyan al -Thawri. He said, إِذَا زَحِدَ abd فِي الدُّنْيَا أَنْبَطَ Allah Azza wa Jal al-hikmah fi qalbihi if, if a servant abstains from the worldly affairs, and we've already explained what the zuhud means, worldly affairs, that which is compromising your deen. If he abstains from that, then Allah will plant in his heart hikmah, wisdom. And then on, he will utter with hikmah. So hikmah will enter his heart, and then he will speak with wisdom. وَبَصَّرَهُ عُيُوبَ dunya, And then Allah Azza wa Jal will then give him oversight regarding the flaws and the blemishes of this dunya. 
This ayub of the dunya, Allah will make him see and give him oversight. And then Allah Azza wa Jal will give him knowledge of da'uha wa dawa'aha. Then Allah Azza wa Jal will then give him knowledge and insight of the diseases of this world and its cure. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us from them. Ameen. Bishr ibn Harith, he asked Sufyan al thawri because once we hear all of these um, t- these athar, one can kind of understand that Subhanallah, we can't even be happy. We can't even we can't even now go and work, or we can't even now seek any sustenance and whatever. It's all dunya. No, these following two statements will give you the balance. So when Sufyan al thawri was questioned, ayakun rajulun zahidin when yakun lahu mal. Is it possible that a person can be zahid and yet he possesses wealth? Is it possible? He said yes. So he, he said naam. It's possible. So it doesn't mean you have to be poor to be zahid. You can possess wealth with the condition. And then he explains naam. In kana idha sabar wa idha u'tiya shakar. With the condition that if he is trialed, then he remains patient. And if he is given, then he is thankful. So if he is given the blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal, then he is thankful. Ibn al-Qayyim also he mentions regarding the essence of this, of how a person can be zahid. He said, Al-Asl huwa qat ala'ik al-Batin. What a person should do in essence is to cut the attachments of the dunya from within. From within his heart. So he doesn't have that marad in his heart. That's what he has to do. And when he does this, when he does this, when he doesn't have that crazy zeal and attachment in his heart and the dunya in his heart, then whatever is out and in his hands, so whatever he has, and then listen to what Ibn al-Qayyim, he says, فَمَتَى كَانَ الْمَالِ فِي الْيَدِكِ وَلَيْسَ فِي قَلْبِكِ He said that if he has that wealth, فَمَتَى كَانَ الْمَالِ فِي الْيَدِكِ وَلَيْسَ فِي قَلْبِكِ He said that if the wealth that he has is in his hands and outer, but he doesn't have that greed and, and crazy zeal for it within his heart, it won't harm him. He said it won't harm him. لَمْ يَدُرُّكَ وَلَوْ كَثَرُ even if you have plentiful of wealth, because within your heart, you don't have that greed and that zeal for the dunya to that extent, no matter how much you have in your hands, it won't harm you because what is in your heart is not affected. And then he went on to say, وَمَتَى كَانَ فِي قَلْبِكَ قلبك Whatever's in your heart, if you have that in your heart, this is words for people of understanding. He said that once you have that marad in your heart, once you have that urge of the dunya and wealth in your heart, even if you don't have money, even if you don't have the actual physical wealth in your hand, it will harm you because it's within inside. So we have to rectify that. This is why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made so much dua of the preservation of the heart. Because if that is sound, then the rest of the body will be sound as well. Ibn al-Qaim also he says that he heard Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said regarding zuhud, tarq ma la yanfa'uka fil akhirah. Zuhud in his essence is that you leave off everything that does not benefit you in the hereafter. To have that piousness That you leave off that Which you fear will harm in the hereafter Look at these words Should be written in gold This is why I always advise My brothers and my sisters Quran, Sunnah, Aqwal as-Salaf Whenever you see someone quoting the words of Allah, he's giving importance to Allah. Whenever you sh- see a person giving importance to the sunnah, that sh- it shows you his importance. And whenever you see someone puts the aqwal of the salaf before his own kalam, then know that he's on a safe road. Because that is 
they are better in understanding and it's more valuable and filled with ilm okay ma huwa mata'al ghurur when is a brief enjoyment or a deceiving enjoyment shall i say is the better word in when it, when is this dunya becoming a deceiving uh, enjoyment sa'id ibn jubair rahimullah ta'ala he says mata'al ghurur ma yulhika an at-talib al-akhirah that that deceiving enjoyment is when it distracts you from seeking the hereafter anything that distracts you from seeking the hereafter then that is a deceiving enjoyment that is a beautiful mizan that we can work with that we can utilize every single day whatever we're doing whatever do it in our work in our, in our lives at our home whatever we're doing let's weigh it up with this particular thing now is he aiding for me to seek my akhirah if it is then alhamdulillah he says wa man lam yulhika fa laysa bi mata'i bi mata'i al-ghurur and whatever does not distract you from seeking the hereafter then that is not from the deceiving um, enjoyment spoke now an hour all right then inshallah <clears throat> we'll take one more and then we'll round up on that note because I'm not sure if Abu Hakim is already here but um, <clears throat> remember one last thing and I thought, Alhamdulillah, it's a good athar to bring regarding seeking leadership. Seeking leadership and position is something that the Salaf spoke greatly about. And even the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is one of the hardest things to battle. Yusuf ibn Asbat rahimullah ta'ala he said az-zuhd fi ar-riyasa ashadd min az-zuhd fi dunya he said to abstain seeking leadership is far harder and greater to abstain from the worldly affairs and that there is short but vast in meaning because many many have been these are one of the things that destroys communities and this is one of the things that destroys the progress of a student of knowledge a student of knowledge that is striving if this marad enters then it's destruction for him and destruction for those around him if he is followed as well and this is why the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that we do not give leadership to the one that seeks it and to the one that yearns for it this is the guidelines that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he gave us that we do that we do not give leadership either two things anyone that's uh, asks for it so if someone clearly says put me in this let me do this let me do such and such let me be in such a position no that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said do not give him leadership and the second one the one that yearns for it you can see from his tasarrufat or certain um, kalam that may not be direct that you think he's seeking it and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve us from that fitna for verily it has destroyed many so we'll round up on that note may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to be able to, to be able to be from those who listen and then are blessed to comprehend and then after we comprehend then it has an effect on upon our hearts that we can be from those that when they hear is affected us and it affects us to the degree that we change and we rectify where we are falling short and then we continue that way may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us firm may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep our families firm and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep our children firm. There are many lectures that we've done recently trying to aid families and ourselves 
Because remember my brothers and my sisters, we don't know what's tomorrow. I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow in front of you or who you'll be here tomorrow. But remember, as we have taken from the textual evidences, there's not a time that comes except after it will be more fitna. If we, when we was in our time, when our parents would tell us things about their time, and then they would complain about the things we were getting involved with, that they never witnessed such things. And now we as parents, we as grandfathers now, are saying the same to our youth. We are witnessing and seeing things that we would never ever comprehend in our wildest dreams of the type of fitna that is occurring. And it will only get worse. And if we don't give importance to Allah's words and to the sunnah of the Messenger which is the only protection and the only cure and the only solution to these problems, we're going to be doomed. Nothing else will save us and our children and our families. Don't think your might or your strength or your muscles or your position, all of this will wear out. The only thing is to put that fear and that ma'rifa of Allah in our heart and in the heart of our children. So when we're not around, they fear Allah. They know this is not right. When a particular fitna comes, they know how to deal with it through their knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah and the words of the Salaf. So may Allah keep us firm. May Allah keep our families and our children firm. And may Allah bless us all with husn al-khatima. Ameen. Wa sallallahu barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Jazakumallahu khairan. Immediate car park announcement. Could the owner of the vehicle registrated LR07XKM. LR07XKM. That's Lima Romeo 07 X-ray Kilo Mike. Could you please return to your vehicle immediately and remove it as it is blocking the gate? Furthermore, second vehicle, MA17LHZ, that's Mike Alpha 17 Lima Hotel Zulu, uh, to Navy Blue Golf. Could you please return to your vehicle and move it? Barakallah. Okay, there are one or two questions. I'll attempt to try to answer some of them. The first question is advice for someone when they are alone, they feel anxiety, feeling overwhelmed, and they overthink. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. If it comes from the angle of they're alone and they're not around righteous companions and they are not around the people that are righteous or in the masjid and then they go home and they feel somewhat where the iman is down because they are not around people that remind them and people that they love if it's on the same similitude of how the companions were when they weren't around the messenger and they went home and then they would feel um, that they would become somewhat weaker in their aman and uh, iman and they would fear that mess they would fear uh, a mock for themselves and, and they'd want to be back with the message if it's on that sabil then it's khair that you want to be and around ahl al khair and you want to be around the masjid and khair if it is that then alhamdulillah hasten to be with them if it's to do anything other than that something which is due to your shortcomings or whether it is something where you are being tested in this dunya, then I advise you to go back to a lecture which I did regarding the trials of this dunya and one regarding how to deal with depression and anxiety uh, through the light of the kitab and the sunnah. Then there is extensive um, uh, direction in that taken from the words of the salaf. How do you interact and deal with the Shia in my college or university who cursed the Sahaba? Well, first and foremost, if you're going to put yourself in those environments where you are going to college and when you are going to university, then know that you're going to come across people that are going to be a fitna for you, fitna for your religion and fitna for you. So 
you have to expect these things. It's not a place that we recommend our brothers and our sisters to be. Because al-wiqayu khairu min al-ilaj. Prevention is better than the cure. We always have, you know, we have to always constantly protect ourselves and stay away from those places that may cause us harm or subject to fitna. As we see in the example of Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam, when he was in an area where he was going to be trialed and there were women around him and there were noble women and they were making advances to him, he knew that remaining in such an environment that that environment was harmful for him, he made dua to Allah Azza wa Jal to remove him from that environment. So this is the same thing that we do. And finally, regarding if they curse the Sahaba and whatever, if they fall into that degree, there is not much that you can say to a people that are as low as that. So I would just avoid them and not indulge in any dialogue with such people. Okay, a question here is that um, if someone lives their lives and they feel and they feel happiness and ease and they do not see trials and difficulties, then is this simply, or is this a blessing or deceiving of the dunya? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, we will never know the ilm al ghayb But like our Sheikh, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi, uh, rahimullah ta'ala, on an occasion when he was questioned and I was in his presence, regarding when do we know if a person is being trialed or a person is being punished? Then Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi, rahimullah ta'ala, he said, you will never know. That is ilm al ghayb That is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, we hope that the one that is upon istiqama, it's upon the straight path, Quran and Sunnah and doing good, then we hope for him that it is a test. And as for the one that is indulging in sin and ma'asi, then we fear for him that it is a punishment. So we say the same. If you are living according to Alhamdulillah, that you're doing all well, you're upon istiqama, you're upon goodness, Alhamdulillah, you're doing and trying to live the way that Allah is pleased with you, then we hope for you that this is a blessing from Allah. And thank Allah, increase and be a thankful servant. And if you are not, trials are not coming, and you are indulging in sin and ma'asi, and yet this is occurring, then fear that this could be tadarruj. This could be something that Allah is giving you now by way of punishment. And Allah knows best. Just before we make the Adhan, can Ishaq and Sulaiman meet their parents outside? Ishaq and Sulaiman. Allah hu akbar Allah hu akbar Allah hu akbar Allah hu akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول Allahu Akbar, Allah. 
There is a question here which is ajeeb. Can a virgin marry someone who has had a past? Well, it, I don't know if it's the boy or girl now. Hold on here. It's a sister. So she's asked a question regarding the man. Okay. So, so this is from the sister's side. Can a virgin marry someone who has had a past? And that past involves having relations with the opposite gender. But he has made toba. If you want the hukam, I can give you the hukam. But if you want the nasiha of uh, Abi Idris, I can give you that as well. So which one is it? If it's hukam, if he's made toba and he's sincere with toba, then whoever makes sincere toba, like la dhambala, it's like he has no uh, sin. Inshallah, Allah Azza wa Jal is oft forgiven and he returns to Allah if his toba is sincere. If it's nasiha, then may Allah forgive me, and this is my own opinion. I will not marry my daughter to a brother who has had sex with the opposite or with the same agenda. I wouldn't do that. I don't want to give my daughter. And Allah knows best. Next question. I go to a public mixed secondary school. And in class, we have to sit with boys. Is it permissible to talk with them about work when instructing by the teachers? See, this is the masiba that we are in. The masiba is in that we put ourselves in these situations. We put ourselves in situations where the ulama have advised against. And then you're going to be obviously, mankind is created weak. So if you're going to be in an environment of the opposite sex, then obviously the trials of opposite sex are going to come. If Yusuf, and I mention him again, alayhi salatu was salam, feared for himself, and he is a prophet, and he feared being in an environment of the opposite sex because of the fitna and what was occurring, then what about us? So this is the nature of how we are. If you put us in an environment of opposite sex, then obviously we're going to be trialed and we're going to have problems. Then this is what comes with it. Speaking so-called about the subject matter, speaking about the topic and the studies, then speaking about what the teacher said, and then it leads to this, then it leads to that. And then afterwards, we find ourselves that my daughter or my son is in a relationship. Oh, Sheikh, what do you advise regarding them being in a relationship? Or my daughter is pregnant out of wedlock, then what do you advise? We advise that you should have thought of that before. And I'm not saying that it's not, I'm not saying that some individuals are not going to fear Allah and whatever. And how do we get out if we don't? It's a catch-22. If we don't have certificates, then how are we going to make hijrah? I understand. May Allah Azza wa Jal make it easy for us. However, whoever fears Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah will find out a way for him. That's a promise of Allah. So there are means and methods that we can take to still get what we want. But if you're going to start putting yourself in these situations, then no, you're asking for trouble. Especially when our children and, or shall I say, the brothers and sisters don't have years and years and years of studying and being around the jama'ah. And even the one that has that will be affected. So my nasiha is if these things can be avoided, it is better for you, sounder for your hearts. Should a sister marry a brother? She is not attracted, but he has good religion. That all depends how many offers she's getting. <laughs> Choose the better one. Now, on a serious note, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. That's a decision that the sister has to make. Because, if you have good religion, then that is from the best of things. Good religion is from the best the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said that if someone إِذَا أَتَاكُمْ مَنْ تَرْدَوْنَ خُلَقَهُ وَدِينَهُ the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once again guidelines look everything we have sunnah gives it an answer 
So no, rather than me saying anything, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if a person comes to seek your hand, and you are pleased with his character, and you are pleased with his deen, then hasten to marry. Otherwise, there'll be facade and there'll be fitted. This is what the Messenger said. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't mention anything to do with beauty or jamal. However, that is a bonus. Even with that though, there are some other ahadith where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told companions to look at certain, the, the people of the Ansar, their eyes are in a certain way. So before you agree to marry, look if that's something for you. So that also shows us the balance of the sunnah. That you try to marry somebody that not only has deen, that's rakam wahid, but someone that you can work with. So then sometimes people say, no, but what do you say? So it's difficult for people like us to give toji heart in that. So I would say, if he's bang on his deen, and he's known for his deen and good khuluq, and he's media oki looking, work with it. A media oki looking guy, or above media oak. I mean, if he's khair, if he's very good looking, then khalas. And he's got deen, khalas. Ala barakatillah. Media oakin, you can work with him. Taib. And he's got good deen. He's much better than a drop dead gorgeous guy. Like in his deen is wak. Deen is the main thing. That is the driving force. Deen. If there's no deen, I wouldn't even entertain any zawaj. If the brother does not have any deen, don't even entertain it. Regardless of what he looks like. Regardless of how much muscles and things that he has or mal. No deen equals problems and talaq. And finally, what is your advice to sisters who refuse relocating to Muslim lands that are, that are safe and have Salafis? due to worldly preferences. Obviously, we've just discussed all about this dunya. If you have the means and you can go to the Islamic lands and make hijrah, not just for sisters, for us males as well. And that is after and better. If you have the means to do that, then do that. And examples of Algeria, Morocco, wherever, wherever it is easy for you to go, and that sister has the means, whether it's by way of her husband or by way of her family, she can go. And even the brothers, if you have means and Allah has given you means to be in the Islamic lands, then that is far better. Regardless of all of the maracas of Salafiyya that we have here, which is khair, may Allah bless it and keep us all firm. All the masajid that we have here, still the Islamic lands are better. Shaykh al-Bani rahimullah ta'ala often used to quote and used to say that the worst Islamic country is better than any kufar country so make that hijrah if you don't see the fruits you will see in your children and may allah azza wa jal bless us to make that hijrah ameen and that's all the questions jazakumullah khairan barakallahu feekum hayakumullah